Oh, good morning. Oh my goodness. Whew, I haven't been this nervous about a message in a long time. I need Angie up here with me. Angie, it's your turn to come be with me. <laughs> oh, first I'm going to pray, okay? Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Rest upon us. Holy Spirit, speak through me today. Open our hearts and our ears and our eyes and our minds to what it is that you're saying today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right. I am um, got a word brewing in me for the last little bit. It's been building, and I'm excited to share with you today. Tom had asked me to um, asked if I wanted to preach, and I said no. And uh, I was like, no, I don't have enough time. We're going to the beach this weekend, and the whole point of him not wanting to preach was so we could have fun with our family. And I was like, that kind of devoids the whole point, as if now I preach. And so uh, the next day, though, um, I was spending time with the Lord, and the Lord said, what are you doing? I have a word for you. Go back and ask Tom if you can preach this word. And so it kind of is fitting because I didn't really want to because I didn't feel like I had the time because I had my own plans. And the Lord was like, no, it's time to preach. So um, we still went to the beach, but I'm still here preaching. And so I just know this is of the Lord. Um, and I'm preaching on serving. Yeah. <laughs> serving. <laughs> Even when we don't want to, right? No, <laughs> Um, no, so I really want to preach on the whole topic of serving, and I'm going to hit many areas of this because serving is not just um, about, you know, um, I'm going to talk about four things, serving the Lord, serving one another, serving the poor, and serving the house. Those are the four areas of service that I'm going to hit today, but why am I hitting that? Because we are a church that believes that we are bringing the kingdom of God to earth, Right? We believe sozo is salvation, which is to be saved, healed, delivered, and made whole, right? We believe in enjoying, enjoying the kingdom of God and bringing the kingdom of God, right? Where this isn't about just all about us, about enjoying, 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 enjoying all the feel goods, enjoying the presence of God, and then like, I don't want to share it. No, just for me. No, it's about receiving and flowing it out everywhere we go, right? We say all these things all the time. We're a living encounter to this world, right? We, the, world is, the world needs an encounter of the Lord, and guess what? You're it. This is what we're born for. This is what this house is about. This house is about equipping saints to go out into the world, and just starts, it starts with us. Sometimes we want to move a God, but we forget we are the move of God. We are what the world is crying out for. He's crying out for Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ lives inside of us. And did you know that Jesus was the greatest servant of the ball? So if we're trying to be like Jesus, and Jesus came to serve and not to be served, then what are we supposed to be doing? Are we here to be served or to serve? We are called to serve. And as we're maturing to be more like Christ, one of the areas that we need to grow in is serving. And this church is one of the, the most amazing churches I've, I've ever seen and been a part of. But if I have one thing to say to you today, it's that we need to grow in this area. And I'm going to talk about that. But this isn't just a message for you, but it's a message for the whole church, the big church, the capital C church, to the church. Because the church is what, people? It's the body. It's the saints. It's the ecclesia. It's the called out ones. You are the church. You are the church. Not this building. You. So when I say the church needs to grow in serving, I mean you. Not the brand, not the name, not Sozo, but me. I'm preaching to myself here as well. I need to grow in serving. The Lord tested me this morning uh, as I was preparing this, <laughs> this word. I was all like, focus on my sermon. I'm busy, you know, don't want to, you know. And Tom's like, oh man, I could really use a massage right now. And I was like, <laughs> I was literally, I was like walking out the door like, yeah, you're on your own. <laughs> and I was like, I have a sermon. And I, was, I heard the Lord be like, are you going to serve him? And I literally, I was, did I say, I was like, I gotta come back, I gotta, okay, it's gonna be a quick one, but I'm gonna give you a massage. And, but literally, right, like how many times do we wanna make it about us and our time and our agenda? But if Christ lives in us, that means that we've died. We've died. We don't get to not serve. 
And what I really want to hit today is you do not need a word from the Lord or to go and seek the Lord in your secret place to ask the Lord to serve. I don't know how many times we ask people, you know, do you want to serve? Well, let me, let me pray about it. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me pray for you. <laughs> All right? No, we don't need a word from the Lord. This is who we are. We are, Jesus Christ lives in us. How can he live in us if the love of God is not in us? And I want to, I want to start today, okay, I want to start um, in 1 Peter 4, 7. This, the title is Serving for God's Glory, is what my Bible says. <laughs> you like that. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. How many of us know Christ's return is near? We feel it in our bones. We're singing it this morning. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Right? Be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The word there when it says minister it to one another is the Greek word it's serve. It's the ministry of Jesus Christ to serve, which means it's our ministry Amen. to serve. That's our call and our mandate is to serve. Number one in that, I want to go to John 13, 35. I'm going to start in 34. So that's John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. But this, all, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Did you know that bringing the kingdom of God, we talk, talk about this all the time in this house, we believe in doing that in word, deed, and power. When, we, when we're bringing the, the, the kingdom of God, that can look like healing and deliverance and inner healing and God, people's hearts being healed. But it also looks by our character and our nature looking like Jesus, by being loving and humble and gentle and kind and joyful. It manifests itself in who we are because, I mean, we, we can go out and we can start praying for people, but then when we turn around and are mean to them because we don't have the character, right? The kingdom of God should manifest itself in both character and in power, but it also doesn't just look like talking good and moving in power. It looks like doing something. It looks like deeds. It looks like works. It looks like serving people. How many times do people tell us they have needs and we're like, we'll pray for that. Oh, I'll be praying that that for you. Yeah. No, we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to meet those needs right there because the world is going to know us by our love. He's, they're going to know the love of God because of how well we love how can they know it if we don't manifest it? It's our job to manifest love to this broken world, and the world needs it. Did you know it's, the world is trying to serve each other? They're trying to help, and they're doing a terrible job, wouldn't you say? Did you know that's because they're trying to do our job for us? Whose job is it to care for the widows and orphans? Ours. Oh, I thought it was CPS's job. Man, they're, they're really good at that, aren't they? They get it right every time. No, it's our job. Whose job is it to outlaw abortion? Is it the government's or is it our job to care for single mothers who are desperate and in need? It's our job to make abortion look so awful because the love inside our church is so great that people come running here every time they have a need. We want the world to enforce our laws, but the reality is it's because they're trying to do our job because we're not doing it. Whose job is it to feed the hungry? Is it the food banks? No, it's ours. Is it food stamps? 
No, it's ours. It's our job. And we've let the world do it. And they're not good at it. And we can sit around and watch the news and complain about it some more. I've, I've tried that. It doesn't produce a lot of fruit in my life. <laughs> or we can just be Jesus to people. So number one is serving the Lord. The number one thing we're called to do is to serve the Lord first. And this is what's happening in the world is you see there's people that don't serve the Lord that are trying to serve each other. And so they've gotten love all wrong. They're so confused. They don't know what unity is. They don't know, they don't even know what love is. And they're trying to, they're trying to do the works of the church, but without serving the Lord. Which is why we can't really do anything apart from that. We have to have our life in order. And it starts with serving the Lord. We have to serve him first. We have to die first. We need to die and let Christ live in us and serve him fully with our whole hearts. And from that place, all the rest becomes joyful and easy. So if we're having a problem with the rest of the ones I'm gonna get to, we gotta go back to number one and say, Lord, I just need more of you. I need more of you. I, I need to lay my life down more. I need to spend more time with you because I'm just not looking a lot like you right now. We gotta start with serving him. Deuteronomy 6, 10. I, uh, I just love this. This is my the prophet side of me. But it really kind of goes back to what God has always said. I just read it in the New Testament. But God has always only asked for us to serve him and to follow his commandments and follow his ways. From the very beginning, that's what he has asked of us. And when we do that, he says he will bless our land and bless us and take care of us. And we don't really need to make it more complicated than this. He says that when we don't bless him, and there's also a warning here as well, but Deuteronomy 6 10 through 19, and it goes on, but I just, this is so powerful. So it shall be, when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hone out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. I want to stop right there. How many of us have come into the kingdom of God? We've come into the promises and we're just enjoying life. It's so good. And we have forgotten what it was like in Egypt. And so then we get busy. We get kind of tired. You know, we have old stories, but no new stories anymore. We used to help people and used to serve until the church hurt us or until someone burned us real good or whatever it is. We're like, man, that just, that was bitter. I didn't like that. I don't want to do that anymore. And we forget. Verse 13, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. Doesn't it feel that way right now? Are we gonna serve our God and obey him and do what he says, or are we going to serve this God of this world? For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of this earth. And it keeps going. <laughs> But I think a lot of us, we, we don't have God in first place anymore. And without God being in first place, the rest of my message does you no good. And so if that's, that's you in this room, I really want you today to make sure that you leave with God in first place. That you have not forgotten that you, where you came from. That you've not forgotten what he did to take you into the promised land, to bring you into the kingdom of God. That he healed your heart and set you free. And to not go back to the things of this world, but to move forward glory to glory to glory for more and more and more. That we take more ground for him. That we don't just enjoy the vineyards for ourselves, but we let others drink from the wine. Right? Did, did God give them the promised land for just them? Is the kingdom of God just for you? No, it's for everyone. But we gotta go out and we gotta tell them about it and we need to love them and show them by our actions that we love them. So let's, um, John 12, 
25 through 26. Go there. John 12, 25. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. We are called to follow him and serve him completely. And he is a servant, which means as we follow him, we will serve this everyone. Which leads to number two, to serve one another. We're called to serve the Lord, and from that place, to serve one another. The one another's this, when I say serving one another, this is the, I want to focus primarily on the people closest to you. We can uh, <clears throat> say we serve the Lord. We can go about and say we're a disciple and we follow him. But do you know who's going to know that the most? It's the people in your household. Are we serving them? Are we serving our husbands and our wives, our spouses? Are we truly showing them Christ by serving them? Or are we just letting them serve us? Or are we hoping that they're gonna just, I don't know, get their act together instead of serving them? I really want us, I think our Spouses should be able to say that my spouse is the greatest servant I know because Jesus Christ lives in them. If our spouse doesn't say that about us, I think we all have room to grow, including myself. Because they're the people that know us the most. So they're either going to know the most of Jesus in us or they're going to know all the stuff that isn't Jesus. And the great thing about that is when things are revealed in us that are not Jesus, we get to take responsibility for that, repent, and draw closer to Jesus to remove those things. I don't want to be known for helping people all around the world and my own husband be like, I don't, yeah, she serves those people over there, but man, I don't know her. She doesn't serve me well. Our greatest testimony is going to be from what our spouses and our families say about us. I think that's why we see a lot of ministries, families fall apart. We see it all over the news or different things. is because we forgot to serve where it was most important. We need to love one another. And we need to serve them well. It's the Lord first. And our families. And then the rest flows out from there. And hopefully as a family... You get to serve the church and the poor and the hungry. It's really a bummer to do that alone. It's way better when you can do it as a family, right? When you all agree. And so I don't want us to forget that the best place we can serve is at home. I just want to be known for my service. Yeah. I want my husband to think that of me my children to think that of me. And so I just encourage you to take a look at your families and maybe ask them, how well do they feel loved by you? How well do they feel served by you? So we can learn to serve better. Because if we can't serve there, we really don't have business serving anywhere else. So let's serve the Lord, serve our families. And then let's go change the world. <laughs> Come on. We have a work to be done. The next part <clears throat> is serving, 
serving the house. When I say the house, I mean the temple, I mean the church building, the priests, this, this house, your family, whatever family you're a part of. If so we have our family at home, and then we have this family right here. If you're a part of this family, then we're called to serve this family. And <clears throat> I uh, was really convicted by the Lord um, when Rich Farrow was here. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to be turning to Acts 6, um, so if you want to start working there. But um, let's see, Acts 6. I think I marked it. So we talk a lot about Acts 2.42. And I'm actually, we can probably just start there. So we talk a lot about this because it goes well with what we were just talking about. I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't want more. We already are in a move of God. Did you know that? God is moving. He's awakening the church. God, there's revival. And it starts in our hearts, right? So we're in revival, but revival's growing and building. The renewal's happening. The remnant's happening. We're taking this earth and we're taking dominion, right? We're not waiting for it. We're in it, but it's growing day by day by day, right? So in Acts 2.42, we use this as a staple verse. It says, and they continued, con continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common. I love that. You ever hang out with another believer and feel like you have nothing in common with them? So it's a weird feeling. You're like, I, I don't know what to do right now, but I just want to talk about Jesus with you. <laughs> um, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, so they met in the church, and breaking bread from house to house. They met in homes. What has Tom been talking about? Yeah. Met in homes. We're going to be doing that. House churches. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Can I have a tissue? So we talk about that a lot, that revival came. Thank you. Revival came, and we talk about that with like sharing with each other and taking care of one another, the one another's, right? This is how we serve one another. We serve our families. We serve when people have need. We take care of them, right? That's much easier to be done in a smaller setting, it's really hard for, for you guys right there, Sharon and David, to know if Shauna and her husband have a need in this type of setting. But in a home gathered around eating together, you can help meet their need and vice versa. These types of things happen as we do life together, right? And as we do life together and we're able to love one another, the world sees our love and the church grows day by day. Acts 4, we see that persecution comes and they pray and their boldness and courage produces more salvations day by day, right? But then we get to Acts 6. I don't hear this one preached as often. Now in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution, so that's the example they use. But I'm going to just use some other examples. So they were complaining about the church. None of us have ever done that, right? <laughs> They're complaining about their certain people's needs not being met. They saw an opening, a hole, a gap. And they went to complain about it. <laughs> I've, we've dealt with that a lot over the years. People come in, they see a need. There's not enough helpers and kids. I don't want to come to this church. I don't feel safe with my kids or this. No one greeted me, so I'm not going to come here anymore. This or this or this, right? But look what happened. Then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. 
Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Everybody was pleased by more people serving. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip and other names I can't pronounce, and but amazing men of God, whom they set before the apostles, and they had prayed. They laid their hands on them. Now this part's so amazing. Then the word of God spread, and the numbers of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of priests were obedient to the faith. We like that. Did you know that you serving in the house of God will produce revival in this community? Did you know that when Bradford is not downstairs serving kids like he is right now, but he's up here teaching the word, we'll be able to reach more multitudes. Did you know that that thing that bugs you about this church is your job to fix it. Did you know that the world is waiting for the church? If we cannot serve in here, how are we gonna go out and serve the world? If we have needs among us, how can we go out and do it out there? We'd be hypocrites. We're not even taking care of our own widows. We're not taking care of our own house. We're not taking care of our own stuff. And we're like, but man, let's, let's go tell the world about this Jesus. We are called to serve this house. And I didn't say you were called to an area you particularly like or feel called to. As family, you're called to serve wherever the need is. We're servants of the Lord. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, even Judas. I can't imagine how hard that would be. I think that would be harder than serving in children's ministry. I hear a lot. We're not called to that. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord and see if I should. Your word is right here. You don't need to pray before you serve the Lord. I don't know who you're praying to. And if the answer comes back, no, you might need to come up for prayer at the end. (laughs) I'm serious. The Lord's not going to tell you not to serve. There's no place too low for you. There's no, no place too low for us, for me, or for any of us. But there is a biblical principle to the fact that there's other people needed on a Sunday or different parts of the week so that Tom can prepare his message, so I can prepare this message to preach it to you. It's not that Tom isn't willing to serve in kids and wouldn't love to serve in kids or serve and hold the door or do whatever it is. That's not the point. The point is, is that we all together work together in our function so we can have a house prepared for revival to come so we can go out and reach the gospel. What happens if 20 more kids show up next week like we're praying for? What happens if, you know, I mean, just all the examples. We don't even have slides on the slides anymore because no one will serve and push the slide buttons because people don't want to do that. And I don't know how many people we complain because they want the words up there. If there is a hole here, it's because you're called to fill it. We need to be the most serving, generous people of our time. There should be no needs here among us because we're sharing of everything we have, including our time, our resources, and everything that we own belongs to the Lord. There should not be one person in this house that says this is their house that is not serving in one capacity. It doesn't follow Jesus Christ. If we're following the same Jesus and we're becoming like him, then your next step in growth is to sign up to serve. And there's a table prepared in the lobby for you to do so today. <laughs> I'm not messing around. I, when Rich Vera was here, and we were up here, and <clears throat> they told me that Angie, 
Talk about a five-fold ministry, right? We have apostles, teachers, prophets, evangelists, and pastors. Did you know our house on staff primarily has one main five-fold minister as a pastor, and her name is Angie Landrum? Okay? <laughs> How many of you? <laughs> Amen. Woman of God. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> you benefit from hugs from her on Sunday mornings? Yes. How many of you have gone to her when you had a need and she's connected you to the right person? Yes. How many of you know that she serves an amazing purpose in this house right here? Okay. So when Rich Vera was here, I was told that Angie was going to be serving in kids because there was no one to serve. And I was upset. You're glad I'm preaching a couple weeks later. I was like, not because Angie's not willing to do it and not because those kids wouldn't be blessed from Mama Angie being down there hugging all of them, but because who's gonna care for you? You don't want, all, you don't want, you don't want the prophets coming and hugging on you and telling you all your problems, do you? You want Mama Angie doing it. Okay, we need the pastor of the house to be free to be the pastor and the shepherd of this house. Or we get off balance, right? We get off balance. We all have a part to play. And I was just so deeply grieved by that. I was like, oh, we're we're sick. Our church is sick. If we're having a problem finding servers, something's wrong. Because Jesus was a servant. And we are called to serve. And so I'm going to leave that there and let the Holy Spirit continue the conviction. But I'm serious about signing up today There are signups in the lobby for every area of this church, and I would like those sheets. If you call yourself a believer and this is your family, they should be full. All right? The last one. She thought I was fired up about that one. Get ready. (laughs) Serving the poor and the widows and orphans. Now this one, you're going to be really happy to serve here when I'm done. Man, sign me up every day. I'm going to be serving here. All right, we're going to turn to Matthew 25, 34. I'll probably just start in 31 because it doesn't make sense to just leave out the context. But mine is titled, The Son of Man Will Judge the Nations. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, yes, Lord, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. And he goes on. You know, I, this goes back to what I was saying in the beginning. If Christ lives in us, then these are the things that will flow out of us naturally with joy. Serving becomes easy and a joy. Loving our spouses becomes easy and a joy. Helping people that are in need 
doesn't become a burden when you have to stop on the side of the road, but it becomes a joy. And I'm preaching to myself here. I, um, there was a season where I was much bolder, you know, um, <clears throat> stop for people all the time, and then all of a sudden you think, I don't know that it's safe to stop for people. We have all these different reasons, all these different things. We call them the wisdom of the Lord. But I'm pretty sure that after I got delivered of the spirit of fear, those thoughts were no longer there. I'm serious. When I was in Burkina, I'm gonna share a couple stories that just cannot be what's said of this house, all right? It cannot be said ever of this house. I was, this was back when we were pastors before, and somebody called me, someone we knew pretty well. And they said, my grandson got taken, my, all my grandkids got taken from, by CPS from my children, their grandchildren, but from their children. And we're pastors at the time. And they said, all, all the kids are in good homes except this one of my grandkids. They won't let us take them because we have a record with CPS and the kids don't want us to take them and this whole big thing or else we would take them. But the deal is, is that, you know, he was really abused and now he has been caught, he's like a little boy, like seven, but he had been sexually abused and so then he had got caught doing something. So they said he can't be placed with anyone with children. And I'm like, dang it, because I would have said yes right, right then. They said, it has to be somebody that doesn't have children in the home. But can you, do you know anyone that will take this little sweet boy that needs healing, needs Jesus, needs to be loved by the Father? And I thought, of course. We have 400 people that come on a Sunday to church. I'll just start calling them and asking to see who can take this sweet boy. And I went down a list and called people. People that were retired and didn't even, they had time, they had the resources, they had three bedroom homes and it was just them. They were young and healthy. And everyone said no. And I was like, what? This is not the church. How can we call ourselves a church if there's a child who needs a home and we say no? I finally was like, okay, well, I called all the older people that have no children. I guess I need to find a young single person. <laughs> so I called our 25-year-old youth pastor at the time who did not really have good housing situation, did not have the money, the time, or the resources, was about to get married, was very actually busy. And I called him and I said, I'm so desperate. I want to find a home for this little boy. I've called everybody we know. And apparently, I don't know any believers. I was pretty upset by this point. But he said to me, can my answer be anything but Yes. but he had not been defiled by this world yet. Like James 127. If you go to James 127. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit widows and orphans in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Those other believers had been defiled by this world. That's what it is. They had worked their whole life to retire and play golf all day and whatever it was. And some of them had various reasons, but I'm telling you, none of the reasons when they stand before God are going to matter. It wasn't one of them. How many of you have empty rooms in your home? Yeah, you can raise your hand if you want to. Yeah. I wasn't going to make you, but you can. 
That room is a home for somebody. We talk about wanting a move of God. But did you know that moves of God are very messy? Because what happens when moves of God happen? Homeless people get saved. People that are alcoholics get saved. People coming off drugs get saved. Single moms get saved. All these people get saved. People off the streets get saved. Isn't that what we want? Well, where are they gonna live? Who's gonna disciple them? Who's gonna help them get on their feet? Who's gonna be mother and father them? You? Please tell me that your answer is yes. Because your answer has to be yes. Your answer has to be, how can we keep bringing in more people in here if we're not gonna parent them and raise them up and help them? If we're not gonna care for their needs? If we're not gonna be there with them and hold them while they're detoxing? If we're not gonna help them find a job and get them clean clothes and go help them with an interview and give them our car? What, what kind of move are you looking for? Are you looking for a pretty one? Where only rich people that already can take care of themselves get saved? Are we looking for a real one? Because Jesus came for the broken, hurting people of this world. He came for the sick. Yes. He came for them. He dined with them. He washed their feet and he let them put oil on them. And he spent time with the people that were defiled of this world. And he brought them in because he ate with them. When was the last time you had someone over for dinner that just smelt? We are called to serve the widows, the orphans, the thirsty, the hungry. There should not be children that need homes if there's a billion believers in this world. There should not be a need for CPS to intervene and do that when we have organizations like Safe Family. Marlene, will you raise your hand, please? Okay. So we had a little meeting here at the church to offer up Christian homes to people so they wouldn't have to go into CPS. And there was only five families that showed up. I'm looking around this room and I'm telling you there's a lot more families in our church than that. But are we willing to die and let Christ live and serve? We are called to serve. We are called to stop for the one. You know, I was calling out to the Lord about Afghanistan, and I'm like, Lord, Lord, what can I do? It's so big. What do I do? He said, just help one. Find one Afghanistan person. You can help and help them. There's a lot of children in the world that need families. Just take one. Is it Salvation Army's job to house the homeless or us? Now, I could do a whole sermon on how to do that well and using wisdom and all of the above, blah, 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 blah. But the problem isn't that the problem isn't that we lack wisdom. The problem is our hearts say no. Our heart has to say yes to be able to teach you wisdom. Your heart has to yearn and answer yes in order for the Holy Spirit to tell you how to do it. it there's no reason in giving you 12 reasons to say no when your answer is never yes. I want today for your hearts to turn to a yes. Yes. Because the Bible says that if Jesus Christ lives in us, then we are called to do this ministry. It is his ministry, and he left us to do it. I, you know, it's nothing like having children. I don't know how many times my, my, my kids were driving by, and there's a homeless person on the side of the road, or someone and panhandling or different things. Mom, why did you not stop? It's a great question. It's a great question. It goes back to remembering, like that song we sang. Do we remember where we came from? Do we remember Egypt? I know Emily gets picked on a lot, but imagine Emily, who got saved, right? But imagine if one of you were out obeying the Lord one day and found your way into a drug house that she was in. 
years prior and said, ta-ta, the kingdom of God has arrived. (laughs) You wouldn't say that, but you would demonstrate it. Imagine the people that are just waiting for an encounter. They're waiting for you to show up in the darkest places. They're waiting for you to stop. They're waiting for you. What if someone that's desperate and hungry, broken down on the side of the road, but we have plans so we don't stop, or maybe it's not safe, or all the things we play through our head. Did you know that God will protect you? If you're, again, back to the first part, Deuteronomy 6, if we are serving the Lord, he will protect us. He will. And not everyone that we take in And who repents? Okay, so again, the number one rule I'll give you, repentance is key. If somebody turns towards Jesus Christ, we pull them in. Okay, we pull them in. And what we would not do to give them the clothes off our back to walk with them and help them. Not everybody is going to treat you as kindly as you do. We have been burnt many times. It's cost us. Michael Block is here. He had spent four months fixing Tom's truck. He was calling it the white devil after we gave it to someone to use. <laughs> and he destroyed it. Like gave us the truck. Well, he actually didn't give it back to us. It was left broke down on the side of the road. And we had to go get it and tow it to Michael's house. And it took four months to fix. Do it again. Because what about the one who now is a pastor of a church? You know, today is 16 years since the day I met Tom on a ferry. I did not approach him to marry him, okay? (laughs) It just so happened. I dare you to find the meanest guy looking looking guy on the ferry. And go up and tell him about Jesus Christ. And invite him to church with you the next week. And bring your car full of people. You know, I had three people with me that Sunday bringing them to church. It wasn't just Tom. He's the only one that's still a believer. Not all of them are going to give their life to Jesus fully. But the one that does can change the world. You know that? But when you're riding your ferry, playing your puzzle, which those are fun, I get it. We should be evangelizing and reaching people. And not just by telling them about Jesus, but by showing them we love them by helping them. It's, it's, that's, I mean, that's a huge one, but um, there's so many simple ways to serve. Bringing food to people. Bringing the cooked meal to someone who's sick. It says visiting the sick. I, I was super convicted by this. I, I have never visited someone in prison before. I can't even imagine what that might be like. We need to go and be Jesus to people and serve this world. And so I want to call us... Um, We need to serve the Lord, serve one another, serve this house, and serve the broken and the poor. That is the mandate. That is bringing the kingdom of God. That is sozo. That is salvation. That is healing. That is everything we say that we are. We have to lay down our lives lay down our time, lay down the things that are enslaving us. I'm speaking to myself that we need to lay down our evenings. We need to be late to things sometimes. There are things that have got to change in our lives. The the idols of this world, as it says in Deuteronomy 6, there are things that are filling our time up that are making us busy that are not what God's calling us to. And even more importantly, first, it starts with our hearts. Our hearts have to yearn and say yes to the Lord. We were in, um, I was in Burkina, and um, there was this guy in the middle of the road. He got in a car accident. This was just his last trip. And uh, he was bleeding. 
And I don't know, he just looked like he was, when we got, I was driving by. And I wasn't driving. And um, I said, stop. Stop, you gotta stop right now. We gotta go help that guy. And the two um, locals that were with me and Rachel were like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, we don't need to stop. The, the ambulance is gonna come. Which, you know, I started laughing in a way. I was like, what? Ambulance, the four that are here that aren't even equipped to deal with the situation. You think we're going to count on the ambulance to come pull the car over right now in Jesus' name? <laughs> like, I'm just like, because the kingdom of God lives in me and whatever is wrong with this man, I can help. And then all of a sudden I was filled with so much hope because I realized that I had a nurse and a doctor with me. <laughs> I was like, man, I was just going to go off the power of God, but man, which is all you need. But I was like, great. I forgot that one of the locals with me is a doctor and then Rachel's a nurse. So then as they wouldn't stop, I said, hey, no, 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 you're a doctor. Come on, let's stop. Let's go help them. He said, well, I can't practice medicine outside of the medical facilities. I said, say what? Tom's seen me. Uh, I said, say what? <laughs> Pull this car over right now. And we did. We pulled over. And me and Rachel ran to this guy in the middle of the street. Was it completely, it was dark. There was a mob of people. There were two white women <clears throat> right in the middle of the street. Was it dangerous? Absolutely. But it's what we do. We run to the hurting. We run into fire. We run into danger. That, that's who we're meant to be. And what was so amazing is I couldn't even speak his language. I couldn't even communicate with him. All I did was lay hands on him and start praying against everything I could think of. All bleeding stop, all internal, all organs be healed. Spirit of death, leave him. I just covered all the bases. I was like, this guy's going to be good to go. And sure enough, like literally within like a minute, this guy, we're carrying him off the side of the road. He's conscious, awake, talking, totally fine. I'm just like, I don't know what just happened, but this guy was laying there unconscious, limp, with blood everywhere, and now we're talking to him on the side of the road with an interpreter, and he's fine. This is... <clears throat> Who says you can't visit the sick? Who says you can't... <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's pretty hard to get into morgues. I'm still working on it. But, uh, but that's the problem is because we gave it over to the government and we got to get it back. But we get it back by deserving it. We get it back by doing it. And we take dominion and we live Jesus Christ through us. So that's my word to you. If you were blessed by this video, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.